often she will entice the groom for some time. Then she pierces her own left ear wherever she desires and places her ring there. Then she sits astride her husband on the marriage bed and pierces his left ear. Kyler's mouth dropped open. Uh, it's not that bad. It just depends on where your wife decides to... Capricia looked up as Master Burary walked into the shop. Affix the seal. Through the earlobe isn't that bad, but some women will pierce, well, like Master Burary's wife. Kyler looked at the round, grinning little man. He wore a glittering gold earring sparkling with rubies. It was through the top of his ear. Oh, 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 hurt like hell. They call it breaking the maiden head. What? Aline was blushing, but her eyes were dancing. For a second he could swear that she was imagining nailing him. Well, it's only fair, isn't it? If a woman has to deal with pain and blood on her wedding night, why shouldn't a man? <laughs> I tell you what, it makes you gentler. Especially if she twists your ear to remind you. <laughs> That's that's what you get after twenty generations of queens. <laughs> but that's not the magical part. When the wife places the ring on her husband's ear, she has to focus all of her love and devotion and desire to be married on the ring, and only then will it seal. If the woman doesn't truly want to be married. It won't even seal. But once sealed, neither heaven nor hell can open the ring again. Master Burary reached over and slipped the wedding ring off of Kyler's left hand. Yeah, look, barely a difference in the tan under your ring, eh? Haven't been hitched long. Hmm? Well, you could make some good ring mail with that trick. Oh, honey, stop it! I'm swooning. You're so romantic. Well, actually, the first practitioners of our art were armorers. Now, but look, with this ring, he can slip it off. It could fall off by itself. I mean, who knows? He he goes to a tavern, bumps into some tart, and how she's to know that he's poaching on another woman's land? Not that you would ever do that, of course, sir. But but. With our rings, a married man is always known to be married. Really, it's a protection even for women who wouldn't flirt with a man without realizing he was married. And if a man or woman wants a divorce, well, you've got to rip that damn thing right out of your ear. Cuts down on divorces, I promise you. <laughs> But a fixing the seal isn't done out of fear, no. To keep a man or woman from cuckolding their spouse, it's deeper than that. Yes, when a man and woman are sealed, they activate an ancient magic in these rings. Yeah, a magic that grows as their love grows. Mm -hmm. It's a magic that helps you feel what your spouse is feeling. A magic that deepens your love and understanding for each other. <laughs> that helps you. Communicate more clearly that you were.、Uh... And let me guess: the more expensive rings have more magic. Kyla, let me assure you, young master, every ring I make is imbued with magic. Even the simplest and cheapest copper band of mine won't break. But yes, yes, I, I absolutely do spend more time and energy on the gold and the mystery rings, <laughs> and not only because the people who buy those rings pay more. But also because those materials hold a spell far better than copper or bronze or silver ever ever could. Right. Well, thanks for your time. Kyler pulled Aline out of the store. Kyler, you are a complete ass. Honey, didn't you hear what he just said? Some armorer a long time ago had a talent that would seal metal rings together. Good talent for an armorer. He can bang out ring mail in days rather than months, and he gets smart and figures out that he can make a lot more money by selling each ring for hundreds of gold than for selling a full set of ring mail for maybe fifty. And lo and behold, an industry's born. It's all horseshit. All that growing to understand each other better stuff—that's what happens to everyone who gets married. And oh, the gold ones have more magic. How obvious is that? Did you see how many of their rings were gold? They'd probably get nine tenths of the poor idiots in the city to save up for a gold ring they can't afford. Because what woman is going to be happy if she gets a copper ring that barely holds the spell? I would. It took the wind out of him. I thought if you ever wanted to get married for real, that you know, it would be a way we could make it official. If we ever wanted to. I mean, I know we're not ready for that. I'm not suggesting that we do that right away or anything. 
So you knew what that place was? Aunt Mia told me about it. Is that why you've been nibbling on my ears at night? Kyla! Is it? Aunt Mia said it works wonders. Well, maybe for these twists. Kyla! Kyla looked around. He'd never seen so many earrings in his life. How hadn't he noticed it before? And he was right. Almost every one of them was gold, and everyone wore their hair in ways that left their ears exposed. I've seen that girl before. Capricia? I was out the other night, and some hoodlums were coming to hurt her. Before, I would have killed them. Instead, I scared them. Well, that's great. You see, violence doesn't solve... Honey, one of them was the Shinga. I made a vengeful man wet himself in front of his subordinates. Violence was the only solution. That girl's in deeper trouble now than before I helped her. Damn! Why'd you even take me in there? We don't even have enough to buy Yuli a birthday present. How could we afford those? I'm sorry, all right? I, I just wanted to see what it was like. It's the sword, isn't it? You still want me to sell the sword. Quit it! I haven't said anything about the sword. I'm sorry. I thought you might be interested. I, I'm not asking you to buy me anything. So... Since we're already fighting... I don't want to talk about sex, Kyla. He raised his hands in mock surrender. Kyla, do you remember how it feels to kill? Honey, we only have so much time and so many gifts. You have more gifts than most, and I know you want to do good. I know you're passionate about that, and I love that about you. But look what happens when you try to save the world with a sword. Your master tried... And look what a bitter, sad old man he became. I don't want to see that happen to you. I know that after the wealth you had, and the things you did, that being an apothecary seems like a small ambition. It's not small, Kyla. It's huge. You can do so much more good for the world by being a good father, and a good husband, and a healer, than you ever could by being a killer. Do you think it's a mistake that God has given you an ability to heal? That's the divine economy. He's willing to cover over what we've destroyed with new and beautiful things. Like us. Who'd have imagined that you and I could get safely off the streets and find each other again? Who would have imagined we could adopt Yuli? She's got a chance now. After being born to an assassin and a madam. Only the God could do that, Kyla. I know you don't believe in him yet, but his hand is at work here. He's given us this chance, and I want to hold on to it. Stay with me. Leave that life. You weren't happy there. Why would you want to go back? I don't. Aline came into his arms, but even as he held her, he knew he was false. In the early afternoon heat, Kyler paused outside a shop in the Nobles District. He stepped into an alley and 30 seconds later thought that he was wearing a fair facsimile of Baron Kirov's face. He wished he'd thought to change into a nicer tunic. Of course, after the fire, he only had one other tunic, and it was worse than this one. It was probably possible to wear illusory clothes like his illusory face, but that was too much for Kyler to juggle. He imagined trying to make an illusory robe flap realistically as he moved, and quickly decided his own clothes would do. He tucked the box under his arm and headed inside. Grandmaster Halen's shop was a huge, squat square. The inside was well lit and more richly appointed than any smithy Kyler had ever seen. Row on row of armor lined the walls and rack on rack of weapons sat before them. It was clean, too, and hardly smoky. Grandmaster Halen must have figured out a clever flu system because the sales area and the work area weren't separated. Kyler saw one of the under-armorers helping a noble pick out the ore that would become his sword. Another noble watched as apprentices hammered on steel that would become his cuirass. The customers were funneled through the work area, confined to special blue rugs so they didn't get in the way of the apprentices and journeymen. It was a good gimmick and doubtless worth its weight in gold. Though whether the nobles were paying for great weapons and armor or just an experience, Kyla wasn't sure. The racks of weapons and armor here by the door were nothing special, doubtless the work of the under-armorers and journeymen. But that wasn't what he was looking for. Kyla looked to the back and finally saw the man himself. 
Grandmaster Halen was mostly bald, with a fringe of grey hair around a knobby pate. He was lean and stooped, and appeared to be nearsighted, though, of course, he had the muscular shoulders and arms of a much younger man. His leather apron was pitted and stained from work, and he was guiding an apprentice's hand, showing the boy the correct angle to strike the metal. Kyler headed toward him. Excuse me? Hello, my lord. How may I help you? I need to speak with the Grand Master. Afraid he's working, but I'd be happy to help you with whatever you require. Kylo looked over Smiley's shoulder and gaped. It was an expression he'd never tried with Baron Kirov's face, but it must have been acceptable because Smiley turned to see what was wrong. Kylo went invisible. He felt like a bad child when Smiley turned around and saw no one there. What the... Hey! Smiley shook his head and walked back toward the counter. Kylo walked through the shop invisible. Dodging scurrying apprentices, he came to stand by Grandmaster Halen's elbow. The man was inspecting a dozen of his Under Armour's swords that were laid out on a table for his approval. The third one wasn't properly fired. There's a weakness just above the hilt. And the next one's poorly tempered. Grandmaster Halen turned and looked at Kylo's feet, two paces outside the blue carpet. Then he looked at the weak sword. He tossed it into an empty red crate. Warner, that's the third reject this month. One more and you're done. As for this... Grandmaster Halen gestured to the poorly tempered sword. You know what happens when you scatter diamonds in front of chickens? Tough poultry? Valuable chicken shit. <laughs> it's a waste, son. This is for an army order. For 250 queens for 100 swords. Some peasant sword swinger can spend more time with a whetstone. You know your swords, but I'm a busy man. What do you want? Five minutes, privately. It'll be worth your time. Grandmaster Halen raised an eyebrow but acquiesced. He led Kyler up the stairs to a special room. They passed the young man who had first seen Kyler. Hey, you, you can't, you, you can't. Oh, don't mind that. That's me fifth son. Bit of a throw off, huh? I'd toss him in the reject crate. Uh, wish I could do the same with his mother. My third wife is the answer to all the first two's prayers. The special room was obviously used as infrequently as possible. A fine walnut table with several chairs occupied the center, but most of the room was given to display cases. Fine swords and expensive suits of armor filled the room like an elite guard. Kyler looked at them closely. Several were the Grand Master's work, masterpieces to demonstrate what he was capable of. But others were old, in a variety of styles and periods of armament. Showpieces. Perfect. You're down to three minutes. I'm a man of special talents. The Grand Master arched an eyebrow again. He did have terrifically expressive eyebrows. Kyla ran his fingers through his red hair and changed it to dirty blonde. He passed his hand over his face and his nose grew sharper, longer. He scrubbed his face as if washing it and the beard disappeared to reveal lightly pockmarked cheeks and sharp eyes. Of course it was all show. He didn't have to touch his face. But this man seemed to appreciate demonstrations. Master Starfire? Galen Starfire? You know me. Galen Starfire was the hero of a dozen bards' tales, but the face Kyla was wearing was Durzo Blintz. I was... I was just a boy when you came to my grandfather's shop. You said... You said you might come back long after we'd given up on you. Oh, sir... My grandfather said it might be in my father's time or mine, but we never believed him. Disoriented, Kyla tried to think. Durzo was Galen Starfire? Kyla knew that Durzo hadn't been known by the same name for 700 years, of course. But Galen Starfire? That name hadn't even been mentioned among all the others that Aristarchos had claimed for his master. We've kept it secret, I swear! Kyla was still disoriented. This man, who was old enough to be his grandfather, who was at the height of his fame, was treating Kyla like... like he was an immortal. Nearly a god. What can I do for you, my lord? Please, don't treat me differently because of your grandfather. I just wanted you to take me seriously. I didn't think you'd remember that. I didn't even remember you. You've changed quite a bit. And you haven't changed at all. Uh, all right, um, well... Uh, what are you looking for? I'm looking to sell a sword. Kyler drew retribution off his back and laid it on the table. 
Halen picked up the big sword appreciatively in his thick, calloused hands, then immediately set it down. He stared at the hilt, blinking. He ran his fingers over it, his eyes wide. You never drop this sword, do you? Kyla shrugged. Of course he didn't. Still, looking like he wasn't sure he was awake, the Grandmaster spit on his palm and grabbed the sword again. What did you... A drop of moisture wicked off the hilt onto the table. Grandmaster Halen released the sword and opened his palm. It was completely dry. He couldn't take his eyes off the sword. He leaned closer and closer until his nose was almost against it. He turned the blade to look at it on edge. By the gods, it's true. What? The coal matrices, they're perfect. I'd bet my right arm every last one has four links, don't they? The blade's a perfect diamond, my lord. So thin you can barely see it, but unbreakable. Most diamonds can be sheared with another diamond because they're never perfect. But if there are no flaws anywhere, this blade is indestructible. And not just the blade, the hilt too. But my lord, if this is... I thought your sword was black. Kylo touched the blade and let the Kakari whoosh out of his skin to cover it. The word mercy inscribed on the blade was covered with justice in Kakari black. Oh my, oh my lord. My grandfather told us. I never understood. I feel blind, yet I'm almost happy for my blindness. What are you talking about? I don't have the talent, Lord Starfire. I can't begin to see how amazing this blade is. My grandfather could, and he said it haunted him all his days. He knew what talent had gone into this blade. He could see it, but he could never equal it. He said it made the work of his own hands look cheap and tawdry, and he was famous for his work. But I never thought to see retribution with my own eyes. My lord, you can't sell this. Well... It doesn't come in black. Kyra sucked the Kakari back into his hand. If that knocks a bit off the price. My lord, you don't understand. Even if I could give you what this is worth, even if I could somehow fix a price on it, I could never. It's worth more than I'll make in my whole life. Even if I buy it, I could never sell it. It's too valuable. Maybe one or two collectors in the world would have the wealth and the appreciation to buy such a sword. Even then, my lord, this isn't a sword that belongs on display. It belongs in the hand of a hero. It belongs in your hand. Look, a hilt that won't slip from your hand even if it's bloody or wet. The moisture slides right off. It's not just brilliant, it's practical. That's not a showpiece. It's art. It's killing art. Like you. Though my grandfather did say the inscription was in Herilica. Right. The mercy on the blade shifted before their eyes into a language Kyler couldn't read. He was stunned. It had never done that before. A snake wriggled in his stomach and strangled his guts. A snake of losing something whose value he couldn't even calculate. It was the same feeling he felt as he thought of his dead master, a man whose worth he had barely known. Nonetheless, I must sell it. My lord, do you need money? I'll give you whatever you want. No, I... I need to sell it. It's... it has to do with a woman. You're selling an artifact worth a kingdom so you can be with a woman? You're immortal! Even the longest marriage will end in a tiny fraction of your life. That's right. You're not just selling this sword, are you? You're giving it up. You're giving up the way of the sword. Looking at the tabletop, Kylo nodded. She must be some woman. She is. What can you give me for it? It depends on how soon you need it. Just whatever you can get me before I leave. Before you leave the city? Before I leave the shop. The Grand Master opened his mouth to protest, but he could see Kyler's mind was made up. Uh, uh, 31,000 queens. Uh, maybe a few hundred more, depending on what sales we've done today. 6,000 in gold, the rest in promissory notes, redeemable at most money changers. Though for that sum, you'll have to hit half the money changers in the city. 
You'll have to go to the Blue Giant directly if you want to change it all. Kyla goggled at the sum. It would be enough to buy a house, repay Aunt Mia, start a shop with a huge inventory, buy an entire wardrobe for Aline, and still put some away, in addition to buying a pair of the finest wedding rings money could buy. And the man was protesting it wasn't nearly enough. A good price for your birthright, huh? The thought almost took the wind out of Kyler. Done! Within five minutes, a still-stunned Smiley had helped load a chest of sovereigns, worth twenty queens each, and watched as his father put a thick wad of promissory notes on top of that. It totaled 31,400 queens. The chest wasn't large, but it weighed as much as two large men. The Grand Master called for a horse, but Kyler asked if they would put two broad leather straps on it instead. Journeymen and apprentices stopped to watch, but Kyler didn't care. Smirking, Hale and attached them himself. My lord, if you ever want it back, it's here. Perhaps, in your grandson's time. Grandmaster Halen smiled broadly. Kyla knew he shouldn't have said it so loudly. He shouldn't have waved off the horse. He didn't care. Somehow, it just felt so good to be speaking with a man who knew something of what he was and wasn't afraid or disgusted, even if the man did think he was his master. But then, Kyla was probably more like Galen Starfire than Durzo Blint had been anyway. It felt so good to be known and accepted. He didn't care that he was being reckless. With a surge of his talent, Kyla hoisted the chest onto his back. The truth was, it was almost too heavy to carry even with the talent. Kyla nodded to Grandmaster Halen and walked out. Who the hell was that? Someday, when you're ready, I might tell you. Hello. Kyla spoke to Capricia when he returned to the ringery. Uh, hello. The arse is back. Sorry about before. What? Uh, no, you are fine. I understand that it all seems strange if you're not from here. Men never like it. Though the women have to pierce their ears too, and they never complain. Right. Well, I... What was it about jewelry that made him feel inadequate? Uh, right. Honestly, most men barely notice the pain. I mean, their brides make sure they're distracted. <laughs> Technically, you consummate the marriage only after the nailing, but in most cases, it's pretty much only technically. <coughs> ah. <laughs> Do you remember which ones she was pointing to? Of course. <laughs> I'm afraid they're the ones that really hold the spells. I have the misfortune of having a wife with excellent taste. It reflects well on her other choices. Whatever the fallout with Ashinga was going to be, Kyla was glad he'd saved her. She pulled out the drawer and set it in front of him. As she set it down, she scowled and grabbed a pair of rings out of the drawer. Just a second. She knelt behind the counter, tucking them away. Then she stood back up. I think it was one of these. She pointed to several along the top row of woven gold and misteril entwined. How much are these? 2,400, 2,800, and 3,200. We do have similar styles in white and yellow gold that are more affordable. The misteril makes them pretty ridiculous. Jorson Alkesti's sword had been misteril, with a core of hardened gold, Durzo said. It took a special forge to melt misteril because it wouldn't melt until it was three times hotter than steel. Once it attained its working heat, it retained it for hours, unlike other metals that had to be reheated over and over. Smiths found it a pure joy and a pure terror to work with, because after that first heating and the first hours they had to work with it, it wouldn't melt again. They only got one chance to get it right. Only a smith with substantial talent could attempt any large-scale work with Mr. Ill. Does anyone wear pure Mr. Ill rings? Kyler scanned the rings. He could have sworn Aline's eyes had lit up when she saw one of these sets. Which one was it? Even if you could afford it, you wouldn't want it, Master Borreri says. He says that some of the simpler spells actually hold better in gold. Even the oldest rings combine the two metals. He has a pair that his great, great, great something grandfather made that look like pure Mr. Rill. 
but they contain a core of yellow, gold, and diamond. It's pretty amazing. He lined the misteril with tiny holes so you can see the gold and diamond sparkling through it if the light is right. Kyla was almost starting to believe the talk about spells. Either Master Burreri was the real thing, or he'd been very careful to learn how to speak about magic from people who were. It still felt like madness to be looking at rings that cost two or three thousand gold. He should have asked Grand Master Halen about the rings this afternoon. The Grand Master would have known if they were legitimate. But Kyla's heart was light. He'd already sold his birthright. He was committed. Now it was just a matter of finding the perfect ring to please the woman he loved, the woman who was saving him from becoming the bitter wreck Durzo Blint had become. Really, the magic in the rings didn't matter. What mattered was letting Aline know what she was worth to him. There was one set. I swear it was in this box. What were those ones you put away? Those were just a display set. Well, not actually a display set. The Queen got furious with a gem merchant who wouldn't sell her some jewels a decade ago, and she outlawed display sets. So it's not technically a display set, but it's not really for sale. We have other drawers. It might have just been in one of those. Just show me the ones I asked about. Kyla was suddenly skeptical. Was this a sales ploy? <sighs> she pulled out the rings and set them in front of him. Just looking at them, Kyla could see the size of his shop's inventory shrinking. Uh, those are the ones. The design was seductively simple and elegant. A bare half-twist of silvery metal that somehow sparkled gold in the light when he picked up the larger one. <gasps> Capricia raised a hand as if he were going to break it. He gazed into one of the shop's mirrors and held up the earring by his left earlobe. It looked kind of a feat. But then, apparently, none of the thousands of men he'd seen around the city worried about looking a feat. Hmm. Kyla moved the earring up higher on his ear. That looked a little more masculine. Uh, what's the most painful place a woman can nail a guy? Right about... The girl leaned forward and pointed, but he couldn't see it in the mirror. He moved, and her finger touched his ear. Oh, I, I, I'm so sorry, I, I didn't mean to touch... What? Oh, no, it's my fault. Uh, seriously, where I come from, ears are no big deal. Uh, did you say right here? So it goes over the top? He checked the mirror. Yes, definitely more masculine. And it would hurt like hell. For some reason, that made him feel better. He picked up the smaller earring and, being careful not to touch her, held it up to Capricia's ear. It was beautiful. <sighs> I'll take them. I'm really sorry. We don't have anything exactly like that for sale, but Master Bureri could make something that looks almost identical. You said there were no display items. Not technically. After the Queen proclaimed the law, well, everything's for sale. They just put ridiculous prices on what they don't want to sell. And these are one of those. These are actually the rings I was telling you about earlier. The ones Master Bureri's great-great-great-grandfather made. Mr. Rill over gold with diamonds? I'm sorry, I'm not trying to embarrass you. They weren't even supposed to be in this case. How ridiculous a price are we talking? Ridiculous. How ridiculous? Totally ridiculous. <sighs> Just tell me. 31,400 queens. Sorry. It hit Kyler in the stomach. It was a coincidence, of course, but Aline would call it divine economy. He'd sold retribution for exactly what it would cost to marry her with nothing left over Aline if this is your god's economy you serve a niggardly god I don't even have enough left to buy a wedding knife <laughs> on the bright side we'll throw in a wedding knife free a block of ice dropped into Kyler's stomach I'm sorry we do have some lovely you get paid a commission on your sales one tenth of anything over a thousand in sales a day so if you sold these what would you do with what? More than 3,000 queens? I don't know. Why are you... What would you do? I can't answer. Well, I'd move my family. We live in a pretty rough neighborhood and we keep having trouble with... <laughs> what does it matter? Believe me, I've dreamed about it ever since I started working here. I thought about selling those rings and how it would change everything for us. I used to pray about it every day, but my mother says we were safe enough. Anyway, the god doesn't answer greedy prayers like that. Kyler's heart went cold. 
They'd move away from that vengeful, arrogant little Shinga. Kyla wouldn't have to commit murder to keep them safe. No. Kyla pocketed the Mysteril earrings and grabbed a wedding knife. He answers them like this. <laughs> Kyla heaved the chest onto the counter and opened it. <gasps> Capricia's hands shook as she unfolded note after note. She looked up at Kyla, tears filling her eyes. <sighs> Tell your parents, your guardian angel said to move. Not next week, not tomorrow, tonight. When I saved you, I embarrassed the Shinga. He sworn revenge. Her eyes stayed huge, but she nodded imperceptibly. Her hand popped up like an automaton's. G gift box? Free! <laughs> he took the jewelry box from her hand and walked out the door, locking it behind him. He tucked the earrings in the decorative box and dropped it all in a pocket, and suddenly was as truly poor as a pauper. He'd sold his birthright. He'd given away one of the last things he had to remember Durzo by. He'd traded a magical sword for two metal circles. And now he didn't have a copper to his name. 31,400 queens, and he didn't even have enough left over to buy Yuli a birthday present. We are finished, God. From now on, you answer your own fucking prayers. Are you and Aline going to be all right? Kyler and Yuli were working together that evening, Yuli fetching ingredients while Kyler brewed a draft that reduced fevers. Of course we are. Why? Aunt Mia says it's fine you fight so much. She says that if I'm scared, I just have to listen. And if I hear the bed creaking after you fight, I know things will be all right. She says that means you've made up. But I never hear the bed creaking. I... well, I think... You know, that's a question you should ask Aline. Ugh, she said to ask you, and she got all embarrassed too. I am not embarrassed. Uh, hand me the Mayberry. Aunt Mia says it's wrong to lie. I've seen horses mating at the castle, but Aunt Mia says it's not scary like that. No, it's scary in its own way. What? Yuli, you are way too young for us to have this conversation. At Yarrow Root. Aunt Mia said you might say that. She said she'd talk to me about it if you were too embarrassed. She just made me promise to ask you first. Aunt Mia thinks about sex too much. Ahem. <clears throat> I'm going to check on Mistress Watson. Do you need anything? Um, ah, uh, no. Kyla, are you all right? You look strangely flushed. Mia rummaged through the newly organized shelves. It seemed to take her longer than when they had been a mess, and tucked a few things in her basket. When she walked past Kyler, who was bent over the potion as if it took all of his concentration, she pinched his butt. Ah. You're uh. right. But don't you get any ideas? I'm too old for you. <laughs> Crazy old coot. Norrington Seed. Kyla, if things don't work out with Aline, will you marry me? What? I asked Aline how old you were and she said 20. And Aunt Mia said her husband was nine years older than her and that's even further apart than you and me. And I love you, and you love me, and you and Aline fight all the time, but you and me never fight. Kyla was confused at first. He and Aline hadn't fought for more than a week. Then he realized that Yuli had been spending her nights over at one of her new friend's houses, probably because Kyla and Aline's fighting had upset her so much. Now Yuli had an eager, scared look on her face that told him how he answered her could break her heart. Specifically, the first thought that popped into his head... I don't love you like that, was not going to be a good choice. How did I get into this? I've got to be the first father in mid Kiru to ever have to explain sex to his daughter while still a virgin myself. What was he supposed to say? I'm not actually married to Aline yet, so when we fight we can't make up the way I'd like. In fact, if we could make up the way I'd like, we probably wouldn't fight in the first place. Kylo couldn't wait until he actually married Aline. All their conflicts about sex would finally be behind them. What a relief. In the meantime, Yuli 
was staring at him, waiting, big eyes wide, uncertain. Oh no, that looked like a lip quiver. Just then, a well-dressed man stepped inside, a house crest embroidered in the chest of his tunic. He was tall and spare, but his face was pinched, making him look like a rodent. Is this Aunt Mia's? Yes, it is. But I'm afraid Aunt Mia just stepped out for a while. Oh, that's fine. Uh, You're her assistant, Kyle. Kyler. Ah, yes. Uh, You're younger than I expected. I've come here for your help. Mine? You're the man who saved Lord Even, aren't you? He's been telling everyone who will listen that you did with one potion what a dozen physicers couldn't do with months of treatment. I am the head steward of High Lord Garazul. My lord has gout. Kyla rubbed his jaw. He stared at the bottles lining the walls. I can return later if you wish. Uh, no, it won't take a minute. Kyla started grabbing bottles and giving orders to Yuli. She was the perfect helper, quick and silent. He soon had four bowls mixing simultaneously, two overheat, two cold. In another two minutes, he was done. The steward looked utterly fascinated by the whole process. It made Kyler think that Grandmaster Halen was onto something in showing off the creation process. He knew in that moment that if he ever had a big shop, he'd set it up exactly the same way, give people a show along with their potions. It was an oddly satisfying little dream. Here's what you need to do. Give him two spoonfuls of this every four hours. I'm getting your master as fat. Hardly ever gets out, loves his drink. He's got a little extra... Well, yes. (laughs) Fat is a leviathan, in fact. Drinks like one, too. That potion will take care of that pain in his feet and joints. It will help the gout a little, but as long as he's fat and drinks a lot of wine, he'll never get better. He'll need to buy this same potion every time his gout flares up for the rest of his life. You tell him if he wants the gout gone, he needs to stop drinking. If he won't, which I'm betting will be the case... Start putting two drops of this... Kyler handed the man the second vial. ...in every glass of his wine. It will give him a terrific headache. Make sure you do it every time he takes wine. While you're at it, you can give him this each morning and night for his bad stomach. And feed him less. Give him a little of this last one with each meal. It should help him feel full sooner. How do you know he had a bad stomach? (laughs) And take him off everything else the physicers have ordered, especially the bloodletting and the leeches. Should be a new man in six weeks, if you make him lose weight. How much? Depends on how fat he is. Uh, No, 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 how much do I owe you? Kyla thought about it. He did some math of what the ingredients had cost and doubled it, he told the steward. Uh, A bit of advice, young man. You should get a shop in the north side, because if this works, there's a lot of noble business that's going to be coming your way. And another thing, if this even helps a little, you should charge twice that. And if it actually does what you said, you should charge ten times that. Otherwise, the nobles won't believe it's real. Well, then, you owe me ten times what I said before. (laughs) If Lord Garazul gets better, I'll do better than that. Here's all I've got on me in the meantime. The man tossed Kyler two new silver coins. Good day, young master. Watching the man go, Kyler was surprised how good it felt. Maybe it was better to heal than to kill. Or maybe it was just good to feel appreciated. How had Durzo done it? He'd been a dozen different heroes over the ages, maybe scores of different heroes. Hadn't he ever wanted to just announce himself? Tell everyone who he was and have them show the proper awe? Here I am. Adore me. But Durzo had never come across like that. Kyler had grown up with him and had never had a clue that his master was the Night Angel, much less any of the other identities he'd had. Why not? Durzo had seemed arrogant in certain parts of his life. He'd certainly shown a huge disdain for most wet boys and most of the Sakage, but he'd never equated himself with the great heroes of history. The pang of loss cut Kyler again. God, Durzo had been dead three months, and despite the passage of time, it wasn't getting any better. Kyla felt the little box in his pocket. He died, so I could have Aline. Let's just get through Yuli's birthday, and then I can ask Aline to marry me. Then Yuli can hear more creaking than she's ever imagined. Kyla, are you going to answer my question? Ah, oh, shit. Yuli, I know you don't feel like it. And you're certainly as smart as someone a lot older. You're still a child. No, I'm not. Yes, 
You are. I just had my first moon blood this week. Aunt Mia says that means I'm a woman now. It really hurt. And it scared me at first. My stomach got real sore, and my back, and, and then... Ah! Huh. Kyla waved his hands, trying to make her stop. What? Aunt Mia said there was nothing to be embarrassed about. Aunt Mia's not your father. Who is? Kyla said nothing. And who's my mother? You know, don't you? My nurse has always treated me different from the other children. The last one always got scared whenever I got hurt. When I got a cut on my face once, she was so afraid it would be a scar that she didn't sleep for weeks. Sometimes a lady would watch us play in the gardens, but she always wore a cloak and a hood. Was she my mother? It was exactly what Mama Kay would have done. She had doubtless stayed away for Yuli's safety as much as she could bear, but every once in a while, the defenses would have broken down. She's important? Kyla nodded again. Why'd she leave me? <sighs> you deserve the answer to that, Yuli. But I can't tell you. It's one of the secrets I know that don't belong to me. I promise I'll tell you when I can. Are you going to leave me? If we got married, I could go with you. If anyone thought children couldn't suffer pain as deeply as adults, Kyla wished they could see Yuli's eyes now. Kyla hugged her. I won't abandon you. Not ever. V rode into Kernarvan as the sun set. In her weeks on the trail, she decided her strategy. Surely Kyla would be known to the Sakage here. If he was at all like Hugh Gibbet, he wouldn't like to go along without killing. If he had taken any jobs, the Shinga would know him. Such a skilled wet boy wouldn't pass without notice. On the other hand, if Kyler hadn't taken any work, chances were still good that the Sakage's eyes and ears would know he had come to Kernavan. V had heard precious little praise for Kernavan Sakage, and if Kyler were truly committed to hiding himself, V would never find him. But it had been three months. Criminals always went back to their crimes, even if they had plenty of money, if only because they didn't know what else to do with themselves. What was a wet boy without killing? The shops were all closed. The decent families were home for the night, and the inns and brothels were just starting to roar as V passed deeper into the southern section of the city. She was wearing white fawn-skin riding pants and a loose men's tunic of cotton. Her red hair was pulled back in a simple, tight ponytail. In Scenaria, the rainy season was starting, but here the summer lingered on, and V believed in being comfortable as she traveled fashion be damned. She only worried about fashion when she needed something from it. Still, after two hard weeks in the saddle, she wouldn't mind a bath. She rode down the fourth bad street in a row, wondering why she hadn't been mugged yet. She'd concealed all her weapons to make herself look totally vulnerable. What was wrong with these people? Twenty minutes later, someone finally stepped out of the shadows. Ooh, nice night we're having, in it? He was scruffy, dirty, inebriated. Perfect. He held a cudgel in one hand and a wineskin in the other. Are you robbing me? Half a dozen teenagers came out of the shadows and surrounded her. Well, I don't know I'm fucking not staring at your tits. The man grinned, displaying two black front teeth. <clears throat> this here's a toll road. And you're gonna have... If you're not robbing me, get the hell out of my way. Or are you a complete idiot? Well, I am. Robbing you, that is. Tom Gray don't get out of no bitch's way. Tom took her black mare's reins. I need to see the Shinga. Can you take me to him, or do I need to find someone else to mug me? You're not going anywhere until you give me 13... <laughs> don't, don't forget about the rest of us. Oh, 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 14 silvers. And maybe a little something-something besides. How about you take me to the Shinga, and I leave your pathetic manhood intact? Tom's face darkened. He threw the wineskin to one of the boys and stepped toward V, raising his cudgel. He grabbed her sleeve and yanked her out of the saddle. <laughs> Using the momentum of his pull, V flipped off the saddle and kicked him in the face. Can any of the rest of you take me to the Shinga? They all looked confused at how Tom had ended up on the other side of the street with a bloody nose, 
but after a moment, a scrawny young man with a big nose stepped forward. Shingus Niggles don't let us come up to him any old time, uh, but Tom's uh, friends with him. <laughs> Sniggle? That's not really his name, is it? Oh. Tom picked himself up off the ground. He charged me. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, uh, Baru Sniggle, uh, who are you? She contorted her fingers into the thieves' sign. That's a little different from ours. Uh, where are you from? Scenaria. No shit. Scenaria and Sakage? Now you. <laughs> he grabbed Tom Gray by his greasy hair. No, are you going to there, take there? me to the Shinga? Or do I have to break something? Oh, fuck you! Fuck you and the mother you rode in on! <laughs> Slow learner, huh? It's already broken! Jamming her fingers deep into the pain points behind his ears, she lifted him to his feet. The boys cowered back, about to break and run. Enough! A short, squat figure walked forward. I am the Shinga. Barush Sneagle. Shinga Barush Sniggle had a pot belly, small eyes under lank blonde hair, and a cruel mouth. He walked with a swagger despite his small size. Perhaps the hulking bodyguard by his side helped with that. What do you want, wench? I'm hunting. My dadder's name is Lord Kyler Stern. He's about my height, light blue eyes, dark hair, athletic, about 20 years old. A dadder? Like you're a wet boy? A wet girl? <laughs> Was it Carlon name of that guy who busted Tom's chops a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, I, I, I think he was uh, staying with Aunt Mia, uh, but he ain't no lord. Shut up! You don't say another damn word, you got me? Tom, get your ass off the ground and bring that bitch here. Oh. Amazing. <sighs> Kyler had made it so simple. He thought he was far enough away, was confident that everyone thought he was dead. She had all she needed to know. It would be a simple matter to find him, and it would be an easy matter to kill him, too. She tingled with excitement. She still had a two-inch scar on her shoulder from him, despite having let one of those foul witches heal her. I think I might just have to take you back to my place. We'll find out how much of a wet girl you are. <laughs> Never heard that one before. The bodyguard had one of her arms, and a triumphant Tom Gray had the other. <sighs> She's one hot bitch, ain't she? Tom grabbed her breast. <laughs> Don't make me do something you'll regret. Can I have her after you're done? Tom squeezed her breast again. And then he petted her hair. Don't touch my hair! Both the bodyguard and Tom flinched at her sudden fury. You little gutter shite! You sewer froth! You touch my hair and I swear I will rip you apart! <laughs> What are you going to do about it, you useless little cunt? <laughs> Tom ripped out the leather thong that bound her hair back. Her hair fell loose around her shoulders for the first time in years. <laughs> you tear me apart. Start with this part, dear. You motherfucker! The talent arched through her so powerfully it hurt. Blasted through the men's hold on them, and her fist cracked Tom Gray's and the bodyguard's ribs simultaneously. Before Tom could double up, she grabbed his hair in one hand. Take a good look at my tits! She stabbed fingers at the corners of his eyes deep into the sockets and tore his eyes out. She spun, and men were running, and in her confusion and fury, she didn't even know which one to chase. He didn't know how much time passed while she vented her shame and fury on the two men. When she came to herself, her hair covered with a blood-soaked rag, she was sitting on a stoop. The Shinga and the boys had fled. There was no one on the street except for her imperturbable horse and two man-shaped lumps lying in the street. Walking unsteadily toward the horse, she passed right by what had been Tom Gray and the bodyguard. 
The corpses were a ruin. She'd... Nysos. She'd never even drawn a weapon, and she'd done this. It's a simple job. The God King will forgive me for not killing Jar. I'll be a master. I'll never have to serve Hugh Gibber in the bed or anywhere else. Not ever again. I'll kill Kyler, and then I'm free. It's close, V. So close. You can make it. Sister Jessie Algwaden was dead. Ariel was sure of it. The villagers hadn't seen her for two months, and her horse was still in the innkeeper's stable. It wasn't like Jessie, but taking risks was. Stupid girl. Sister Ariel knelt as she entered the oak grove, not to pray, but to extend her senses. This grove was as far toward the Iosian forest as the locals were willing to go. The villagers of Taurus Bend prided themselves on their practicality. They saw nothing superstitious or foolish about giving the hunter the same wide berth their ancestors had. The tales they had told her weren't wild-eyed ravings. Indeed, they were believable because of their lack of detail. Those who entered the forest didn't leave. Simple as that. So the villagers fished in the meandering Red River and collected wood right up to the edge of the grove. But there they stopped. The effect was jarring. Centuries-old oaks abutted directly on bare fields. In some places, younger oaks had been cut down, but once the trees reached a certain age, the villagers wouldn't touch them. The oak grove had been slowly expanding for centuries. She felt nothing here, nothing beyond the cool of a forest, smelled nothing except clean, damp air. When she rose and walked slowly through the low undergrowth, she kept her senses attuned, pausing frequently, stopping when she imagined she felt the slightest trembling in the air. It made for slow progress, but Ariel Wyant Safasti was noted for her patience, even among the sisters. Besides, it was recklessness that had gotten Jesse Algwaden killed, probably. Though it was only a mile wide, it took her a long time to traverse the oak grove. Each afternoon, after marking her progress, she returned to the inn and slept and took her only meal of the day. The weight was coming off, blast it, if slowly. Each night she returned to the forest on the chance that whatever magics had been placed on the forest were affected by the time of day. On the third day, Ariel came within sight of the forest itself, and the line between the oak grove and the forest proper was stark, obviously magical. Still, she didn't hurry her progress. Instead, she moved even more slowly, more carefully. On the fifth day, her patience paid off. Ariel was thirty paces from the line between oak grove and forest when she felt the ward. <gasps> she stopped so abruptly, she almost fell down. She sat, heedless of the dirt, and crossed her legs. The next hour, she spent simply touching the ward, trying to get a feel for its texture and strength, without using magic of her own. She worked long into the night, checking and double-checking and triple-checking that she was right and that she hadn't missed anything. The weaves were simple. One simply registered whether a human had crossed the boundary. The second, slightly more complicated, marked the intruder. It was a weak weave that clung to clothing or skin and dissipated after only a few hours. Cleverly, Ezra, Ariel was making an assumption, but she thought it was a good one, had put the weave so low to the ground that it might mark the intruder's shoes, so low that it would be covered by the undergrowth. The real cunning of it, though, was the placement. How many magi had seen the obvious line 30 paces beyond this and walked right through the trap before they raised their defenses. It would be easy to circumvent the trap now that she saw it, but Sister Ariel didn't. Instead, she wrote her findings in her journal and returned to Taurus Bend. If she'd made any mistakes, she would die before she got back to the inn. It made for a tense walk. The soul soared at the thought of dismantling Ezra's ancient magic, but she didn't give in to the temptations of arrogance. The speaker's letters were getting shriller, 
demanding that Ariel find Jesse, that Ariel do something to help her avert the rising crisis with the chattel. Ariel kept her eyes open, hoping to find a woman who might serve her sister's purposes, but the villagers of Taurus Bend were careful to send away every child who showed the least talent. Ariel wouldn't find what Vistariel needed here. So she ignored the letters. There was a time and place for haste. It wasn't here, and it wasn't now. Viridiana Sovari? Hearing her name made V skid to a stop in the crowded market. A dirty little man bobbed his head nervously. He extended a note toward her, but she didn't take it. He was being careful not to stand close to her, and he wasn't ogling her, so she guessed that he had an inkling of what she was. He smiled obsequiously, shot a look at her breasts, then stared stubbornly at his feet. Who are you? No one important, miss. Just a servant of our mutual master. V's heart turned to ice. No, it couldn't be. He extended the note again, and as soon as she took it, he disappeared into the crowd. Mulina, we are very curious indeed how you knew Jor was going to be in Carnarvon. But that you did know tells us that you are indeed the best. We also desire that you deal with Kyla Stern. We prefer him alive. If this is not possible, we require his body and all belongings, no matter how trivial. Bring them immediately. He closed the note. It was impossible that the God King knew where she was. Impossible that a note from him had beat her here. Impossible that Jarl could be here. Jarl, whose identity was supposed to be secret. Jarl, whom she'd been fleeing. Impossible to do what the God King asked. But the great impossibility was the only impossibility now. It was impossible to escape. V was the God King's slave. There was no way out. Somehow, Kyler had been roped into making the dinner for Yuli's birthday. Aunt Mia had said no man should be intimidated by a kitchen, and Aline had said that, compared to the potions he made, a dinner and dessert should be easy. And Yuli just giggled as they put him in a frilly lace apron and dabbed his nose with flour. So Kyler found himself with his sleeves rolled up, trying to figure out arcane cooking terms like blanching and roux and proofing. What do I do after the jelly, uh, weeps? <laughs> Kyler struck a pose with the spatula. <laughs> the door to the smithy opened and Brian walked in, dirty and smelly. He gave Kyler a flat look that made him lower the spatula, deflated, but he refused to wipe the flour from his nose. Brian turned his eyes to Aline and looked her up and down. When's dinner? We'll bring it out to your cave when it's ready. Mm. Elaine, you ought to find yourself a real man. You know, I know a wet boy who'd like to pay that Cretan a visit. Kyla! I don't like the way he looks at you. Has he tried anything with you? Kyla, not tonight, all right? Kyla was suddenly aware of the ring box in his pocket. He nodded. Putting a serious look on his face, he attacked Yuli, <laughs> put her upside down, and draped her over his shoulder. Aunt Mia came into the kitchen. Oh, I can't believe it. We are all out of flour and honey. Oh, no. How am I going to make the fifth mother sauce? Kyla set down his spatula and hunched over, extending his hands through his legs. On cue, Yuli slid headfirst down his back and grabbed his hands in time for him to pull her through his legs. She landed on her feet. Isn't it... Someone's birthday? Mine! Mine! He pulled silver out of each of Yuli's ears. Two silvers. It was a bonus the noble had given him. It left him and Aline with nothing again. But Yuli was worth it. When he put them in Yuli's hands, her eyes got big. <gasps> For me? Aline will help you find something good, all right? Can we go right now? Kyla looked at Aline, who shrugged. We can go with Aunt Mia. I've got to peel the peas anyway. <laughs> Yuli pranced to the door and showed Aunt Mia her coins. Aline touched Kyler's arm. Are we going to be all right? After tonight, we are. What do you mean? You'll see. Kyler didn't smile. He didn't want to give it away. If he smiled, he'd grin like a fool. He couldn't wait to see the look on her face. He couldn't wait for other things as well. He shook his head and went back to cooking. 
Contrary to what he'd said, the meal wasn't hard to prepare. It was just messy. He slipped off his ring and put it on the counter before he picked up the raw meat. There wasn't much romantic about smelling like dead cow. Aline and Yuli and Aunt Mia left to go out shopping. Kyla put down the spatula again and walked to the door. What did you forget this time, Yuli? It was Jarl. Kyla felt like the wind had been knocked out of him. He couldn't believe his eyes, but there he was, lean, athletic, impeccably dressed, as beautiful a man as you'd ever see, his dazzling white teeth showing an uncertain smile. Hey ho, Ezo! How in the nine hells did you find me, Jarl? <laughs> Aren't you going to invite me in? Please. Kyla put some utai on and sat across from Jarl, who helped himself to a seat by the window. There's this job. Not interested. So, uh, what is it about this that you like again? Didn't Mama K teach you tact? I'm serious. So am I. You show up after I tell you I'm out of the business, and the first thing you do is insult the place I live. Logan's alive. He's in the hole. Kyler just stared at him, uncomprehending. Logan's alive. The words collided with each other and shattered on the floor, He's in the hole. shards sparkling with the light of truth, but the whole truth, nothing more than splinters and points too sharp to touch. All the wet boys are working for Kalador. The resisting nobles have retreated to the Gaira estates. Several of the frontier garrisons are still manned, but we have no leader who can unite us. There's some trouble up in the Freeze that the God King is worried about, so he hasn't done anything to consolidate his power yet. He thinks that the noble families will tear each other apart. And if we don't have Logan, he's right. Oh, Logan's alive? The God King has our former wet boys looking for me. It's part of why I came here. I had to get out of Scenaria until we could get word out that Kage himself is protecting me. No. Every day, the chances that Logan will be discovered gets worse. Apparently, none of the prisoners in the hole has recognized him, but they've started throwing a lot of people down there. It might please you to know that Duke Vargan is one of them. Look at it as a little bonus. When you rescue Logan, you can kill that twist too. What? Jarl, uh, Tensa isn't Tensa Vargan. Don't you see? He got himself thrown in the hole so he can do the hardest time there is. Then they produce the real Baron alive, and Tensa is released. He comes to the Sakage a month later with a grudge for his false imprisonment and all the access of a duke, and what happens? We take him in. How could we resist? And he destroys you because he's not Tensa Vargan. He's Tensa Ursul. You see, Kyler? This is why I need you. Not just for your skills, for your mind. If Tensor's there right now, he's only going to wait long enough that his stay in the hole is credible, and then he'll tell his father that Logan is in there. We have to go now! Now! The ring box was burning against Kyla's leg. He looked through the open window as Jarl spoke, seeing the city he'd hoped would be his home for the rest of his life. He loved this city, loved the hope here, loved healing and helping, Loved the simple pleasure of being praised for his potions. He loved Aline. She proved to him that he could do more good by healing than by killing. It all made sense. And yet... And yet... I can't. I'm sorry. Aline would never understand. Don't get me wrong, Azo. Because I grew up with Aline too. And I love the girl. But why do you give a shit what she thinks? Fuck, Jarl! Hey! I'm just asking. I love her. Well, sure. Sure. That's part of it. She's good, Jarl. I mean, like people aren't good where we came from. Not good because it will get her something. Not good because people are watching. Just 